Hello. This presentation is going to be about the trapping of fluids in a porous medium and the principal mechanism by which this happens called snap off. So what is this and why is it important before we even start? Well, if you have a piece of rock and you put something into the rock, it's very difficult to get it back out again. So oil has migrated into an oil reservoir. Engineers drill wells, pump in water, pump in other fluids, try their best to get every last drop of oil out. You're lucky if you get half out. If we were to inject CO2 in the subsurface into porous aquifers, again, there's a concern that maybe the CO2 is going to leak out. Even if we were to try and get that CO2 out, most of it would stay underground. So why is that? It's because fluids are retained in the pore space, surrounded by the other phase, and then they can't move. So let's show that. Let's actually image that. Let's take x-rays and look inside a rock during one of these displacement processes. So that's what I'm going to show. Use fast x-ray imaging to look inside a small piece of rock, actually one that's just a few millimetres, five millimetres across, while water is displacing oil and see what happens. So that is going to be shown on the slide. Okay, so what do we have here is in yellow is shown the oil, water is moving from the bottom upwards, but it's not shown, neither is the rock, just to make it really clear. The water's coming up from the bottom. We're taking images every 45 seconds. This is not in real time, this is showing a few hours. What's going on? Water's going in the nooks and crannies of the pore space. The oil here, yellow, is getting trapped. It's getting surrounded by water and then isn't moving. The total system size here um, is about four millimeters uh, shown in the so that's interesting. What was actually going on there? That's an image, you can see what's going on. It's a sort of video, but I don't really get a deep scientific understanding unless we have some schematic. So here is a schematic of what's going on and what we call snap off. So in these pictures here, what's shown here in gray is the water and what's shown transparent will be uh, the oil in the pore space. So when we inject water, which here is the wetting phase, the water likes the surface, so it tends to collect in the corners. So if we were to take a cross section through here, then this is a schematic triangle. Of course, real porous media are more complex. We've shown the real porous media, but the same generic things occur. We have water here in the process. We now inject water, so the water increases in saturation. Where does it go? Well, it stays in the corners, but the water in the corner swells. So what happens is we get more and more water. But there comes a point, a critical point, at which the water has essentially more or less filled the corner. And if we were to put more water in, it's no longer retained in the corner, it's no longer stable. In fact, what would happen is the radius of curvature would decrease, which would actually lead to a an increase in capillary pressure, so water would rush in. That's the snap-off process. So this is an unstable configuration. I add more water, the water rushes in, it fills this narrow region of the space. And we're left here with water filling here. Now what's that done is the water has broken a flow path for the oil. So imagine a big pore with lots of little narrow so-called throats leading away from it. These get filled with water. The oil is then trapped and surrounded in the center of the pore space. And that process is called snap off. It was first described by Piquel et al. in the petroleum engineering literature and was described in more detail through micromodel experiments in the beautiful and seminal work by Roland Lenormand and uh, colleagues. So that's a schematic of the process relatively quickly so that you can sort of understand what's going on. Now, what we're going to do is going to go back to those x ray images but we're gonna zoom in on a single region of the pore space and observe this process. So here we have a trapping event, right? What we see, the oil moves in, the water moves in here and displaces the oil, and then it's swelling here. 
and traps. Okay? So this is this ganglion of trapping event shown repeatedly. And what happened was water is not shown, the oil is shown here in red. The water pushed some oil out. But then what happened is it was swelling in the corners here, filled this narrow region, and then left the oil trapped as a blob. This is inside real rock, imaged over a, a, a time of about 24 minutes, showing this trapping effect. So now what we're showing here is just some pictures of what this, this means. So for oil recovery, if we have a water wet rock, the oil can be trapped in the centers of the large pores. And this is bad for recovery. You leave the oil underground. See exactly the same uh, for CO2 storage. That is, CO2 is injected underground, and then after injection, the CO2 will move. It will tend to move upwards in the aquifer, or it will be displaced by regional groundwater flow, or indeed we might uh, artificially pump water. So what is shown in these uh, pictures here is a core sample again, uh, this time about six millimeters across, about 20 millimeters long, where CO2 has been injected. And after CO2 injection, we're just showing the, the carbon dioxide, the CO2 phase, which is non wetting Blue is one big cluster of CO2 that's connected. So that, that carbon dioxide can flow and could potentially escape. Okay? The other colors are regions of car where the carbon dioxide is actually already trapped in the pores of the surrounding water. Then you have water flooding. And what you see here is lots of different colored blobs. The colors now don't really mean much but every single blob is trapped in the pore space. And these occupy several pores, so they're quite complex, but the CO2 is retained in the centers of the pore space. So how much is trapped and how much can be stored? Well, what we have here, this graph here, is how much is trapped, so the residual saturation against the initial saturation here. And uh, we have two curves, one is just oil water, one is carbon dioxide water, these are these lower points. And what you see is the more CO2 you put into the rock, the more you're going to trap. So more CO2, the CO2 occupies more of the pore space, so there are more pores in which it can be trapped when water goes in. That seems to make sense. And this is the behavior that we see for Bentheimer sandstone. So you can see visually, actually CO2 storage is potentially quite safe because the CO2 is injected underground. Then you might say, oh yeah, but the CO2 is going to move and escape. Yeah, but where it moves, it leaves this trail of trap blobs behind. And so it sort of runs out of material relatively rapidly. And we see here, a low saturation, we are trapping. And so you put in 50% and we trap uh, almost 30%. So we're trapping most of the CO2. So very interesting. Um, but how do you know that wasn't a sort of one-off fluke with the experiment? So the beautiful thing here is this experiment was repeated five times. So this is Bentheimer sandstone, and the experiment was done five times. And we see the same amount of trapping exactly where the trapping occurs is different from place to place, but overall we see the same amount of trapping. What's shown underneath here are the raw images. Uh, the gray is the rock, the black is the CO2, and the lighter color here is the brine, the salty water that's doing the trapping. So, Bentheimer, we see this, we, we have a residual saturation here of just over 30%. But maybe there's something special about Bentheimer and other sandstones will be different. Um, so the next one is Doddington, another uh, relatively uniform quarry sandstone, and we see generically the same behavior. Then people said, okay, what about carbonates? Because carbonates have a calcite surface. Maybe those surfaces have an affinity for carbon dioxide. And so it's sort of, you know, CO3 on CO2, and so it's not really non-wetting, and anyway, com carbonates are complex, and so they're gonna be different in some uh, unexplained and mysterious manner. Um, the answer is the trapping, they are not. So here are two uh, carbonate samples, Estiolardes and Ketten. Um, Estiolardes has a very complex pore space. Uh, Ketten has a slightly more uniform pore space, but in both cases, again, in repeated experiments, we see a significant amount of carbon dioxide, which is trapped. So that um, is all I wanted to say there about the, the trapping process is something that we can image with x-rays. We can even see the dynamics of this process. But the bottom line, so to speak, is 
if we have a water wet system and we inject water, the water likes the nooks and crannies of the pore space. It swells in the corners of the pore space and fills preferentially the narrow regions. And it traps the oil in the large regions. So it's a little bit like a, a road network where you start barricading the side streets, some of the narrow regions. But eventually, <laughs> the traffic can't move at all and the cars are all backed up maybe on the main roads or in the major roundabouts and junctions, you can't find it. It's very important. And it's the principal reason why you don't get all the oil out of a reservoir. Oil and water don't mix and the oil's trapped in the pore space. And it's also the reason why long-term CO2 storage is actually likely to be quite safe and secure because the CO2 is going to remain trapped underground and it won't be able to flow. Okay, so that uh, finishes that brief introduction.